My name is Firuza Abdulayeva, um, and uh, I grew up in St. Petersburg. It used to be Leningrad in those days, and it was a completely different country. And uh, I was studying at the Oriental Faculty, and, uh, and then I continued um, doing my PhD there, uh, studying Persian. But in uh, um, those days, especially at our department, we had quite a good education. <laughs> in those days because we inherited a fantastic school of oriental studies at uh, the university and we uh, had not only uh, literature or history of the region but we also had art and uh, even the undergraduates could uh, have access to um, see study and even touch the medieval manuscripts illustrated beautiful manuscripts which Mm, th th this is probably the time when I started to be interested and uh, really fascinated by mm, what the Iranian heritage is. And of course, um, that was the Institute of Oriental um, Manuscripts. Now it is called, in those days, it was called the Inst Oriental Institute. And we also had our weekly classes at the Hermitage Museum, where also they had a fantastic collection of um, Persian art, starting from... Um, um, the Achaemenid period, and then fantastic uh, collection of Sasanian silver, then up to the uh, early and later Qajar period. So it's uh, the whole history of um, Iran uh, uh, was represented there in material culture, probably one of the best collection in the world. We were very lucky because we had uh, among our teachers, we had curators from the Hermitage Museum, we had people coming from the Oriental Institute because they were not only um, professors at our faculty, but they also had their own job and they could really welcome us, us there and show their treasures firsthand. It was incredible. And I was only 16 when I went to the university. So for me, it was, you know, the whole world was opening. <laughs> at well, how best. many languages do you speak, Firuza? Not many, unfortunately. My first language is Russian. And then, of course, I, I was studying Persian at the university. And the, as far as one of our many, many subjects was even dialectology. We um, were learning some Tajik language, some dialects in the Pamir Mountains. We were studying some of the uh, southern dialects in, in Iran. But uh, of course, according to the rules of um, that faculty, we couldn't study Persian without Arabic because it was, you know, uh, especially after the arrival of Islam to Iran, mm -hmm. without Arabic, you, you, you wouldn't, it was considered that you wouldn't really understand well the, the culture of contemporary Iran. So that was um, compulsory. At some stage, I was even teaching Arabic to. Um, our first years undergraduates because the professor who was uh, responsible for organizing that course, unfortunately, he was very unwell that year, so I had to do that. But um, um, yes, and uh, I'm speaking in English, <laughs> so this is more another language I, I, I think I, I, I do know. Fantastic. So you are interested in many languages. And you, you mentioned um, the, the art that you came across when you were studying uh, all these um, artifacts from Iran made you interested in this culture. Is this why you started uh, wanting to learn Persian? Or did it have an effect? Or was there another factor that made you want to learn Persian? It's a very interesting story. Of course, I, I was studying in the um, art school uh -huh. when I was um, still at school. It was a, 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 a second school, the evening classes. Because um, three times a, a week, I would come to that school. Uh, actually, my um, um, schoolmate, Veronika Shimanovska, she is now curating our exhibitions on contemporary Shahnameh, and we, we call it um, Shahnameh Forever. It's contemporary Persian art, and we have it annually in Cambridge. 
But we studied in those days together art and the, it was theory of art. We had the sculpture, painting, drawing, several other things. Um, yeah, so together with um, the fascination of um, um, oriental things, which uh, um, I, I was seeing in, in different museums, um, I was going to apply to read Arabic, to be completely honest with you. Mm -hmm. But when I came to um, apply, it, it, it had to be all in person. And uh, I saw that among the professors, the, the strongest department was Persian, because we still had those Buzurgan, mm -hmm. uh, who unfortunately started to pass away, more or less, um, right after I graduated. So I was extremely lucky and fortunate that all this creme de creme of um, Oriental studies, especially in on, on Iran, I, I happened to know them in person and they were absolutely incredible. They were representatives of that old school, pre-war, pre, -war, pre um, more or less uh, inheriting the, the, that, that, um, knowledge which was um, created during the generations and they were standing on the shoulders of the giants themselves. So I, I think I, I, I've been very lucky with my education. Fantastic. So a uh, fate had something to do with you learning Persian at the end of it. So it's, it's, it's an interesting story. Yeah. Um, and I know that you tend to write, obviously and you're involved uh, with the Shahname project. But uh, in terms of writing, do you mostly write about Shahname or is it a range of other subjects that you write about? I wrote my very first paper on the Shahname when I was already teaching at the university and I was already assistant professor. Mm -hmm. So that was quite later, late in my career. Um, but um, it was a very interesting manuscript because I started to catalog Persian manuscripts at um, uh, the Oriental faculty in, in St. Petersburg. And uh, um, one of the most interesting illustrated manuscripts was actually the Shahname, the copy of the Shahname, but in Turkish. And uh, it was so interesting. Um, because normally you, you, you wouldn't have many illustrated copies uh, of the Shahnameh in um, other languages. Mm. So it was unique. And the, the, it, later I discovered that uh, the other, it was in two volumes. And uh, one volume happened to be in Petersburg by Odessa. By, it, 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 it was a very long journey of this um, beautiful uh, manuscript, but the second uh, volume is now in Sweden. Um, so, um, yes, the Shahnameh is um, one of my subjects, probably nowadays one of the main ones. And uh, um, last time when we were talking about this subject, I was saying that uh, it's, uh, it's a very um, important work and a, a very important author for me because um, my PhD was about something completely different. It was uh, about the manuscript of um, um, a very early Persian tafsir, the commentary on the Quran, okay. and, uh, <laughs> which was published in Iran many years ago, but uh, it wasn't very properly studied. So um, I, I decided that uh, that would probably be a, a good way to learn and uh, present this um, uh, subject to the outside world. And I'm very grateful to my supervisor who was really taking serious travel and attention in what I, I was doing. He was the, the um, very famous scholar, um, academician, full, full member of the Russian Academy, Mikhail Bogalyubov. Um, so Islamic studies is an, another same um, I've been working on, but uh, later on I started to be more interested in art, as, as you said, because um, 
especially when I uh, started to teach. And uh, one of the courses I always had was Persian literature. And uh, um, my favorite period is um, the golden age of Persian poetry, which is the main component of Persian na na national identity, I would say, because uh, you, you can't imagine an Iranian person not knowing Persian literature, especially poetry. So we have this golden age, uh, starting from the ninth century, roughly, from Rudaki, the Adam Shara, the very first poet known, uh, who would be writing good poetry in Persian up to probably the 15th century. It would be Abdurrahman Jami and uh, um, those who inherited what he was representing as the, the, the great classic of Persian poetry. And uh, of course, later I started to write more on uh, um, illustrated manuscripts um, of Persian literary classics. That would be not only the Shahnameh, but Nizami and the Jami. And um, uh, that brought me to another topic, uh, which is uh, um, intervisuality or um, visual presentation of intertextuality. Uh, roughly speaking, this is what we um, call the wandering subjects. Because, for example, the, the story about um, Yusuf and Zuleikha, mm -hmm. more or less universal. We have uh, the same story in the Bible. It's the story about uh, Joseph and the wife of Potiphar. We have it in more or less every um, single literary culture. And uh, uh, apparently the earliest um, um, evidence of this story goes back to the classical period of ancient Egypt literature. And the scroll with this um, story is now kept in the British Museum. So it's very, very old and we have it and up to um, the novels of Thomas Mann. We have a poem by Marina Tsvetaeva. So we have it everywhere. It depends on how mm, every um, um, author is interpreting and what he or she is trying to say using the paradigm of the already well-known story. So this is another <laughs> uh, subject which is uh, among my favorites. And of course, mm, um, art brought me to another mm, theme, which is um, something completely different. It, it is a diplomatic gift exchange between the three main empires of the early 19th century. This is the famous great game. And uh, I'm talking about um, Persia, uh, Britain, and Russia, two superpowers of those days. Uh, this is the early Qajar period. This is uh, um, the hero Fatali Shah, his son Abbas Mirza, and uh, my personal hero is the son of Abbas Mirza, Khosrow Mirza, who was sent to St. Petersburg to apologize for the accident which happened in Tehran in um, uh, 1829. And uh, his journey from Tabriz to St. Petersburg was described in the diary of his mission. And this is how he was discovering um, a completely different culture. And this diary was used by um, all other um, Iranian rulers who were going to Europe. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, the Saradid Shah, his famous journeys to to London, Paris, St. Petersburg, and how he was fascinated by um, the realia of a uh, different life, like for example, ballet dancing in, in the theaters or, or French drama. It was all very um, um, beautifully described already by, by Khosrow Mirza and his companions. So th this is just very, um, and of course, the, the, there is my favorite story about the Skandar, um, Alexander the Great, and how his stories are interpreted in different um, uh, versions of Persian literature. So he's um, starting, for example, in Firdousi, in, in Firdousi's uh, version in the Shahnameh, he's still a horrible um, character who arrived to Iran as a usurper, 
And uh, he's a sort of obsessively trying to kill as many people without any particular reason. He's just a, um, a conqueror. And later on uh, in the Zami, in Amir Khasrao Dehlevi, in, in other versions, he is turning gradually from this uh, absolutely horrible um, conqueror to a philosopher who is surrounding himself by wise people like um, uh, Aristotle, Socrates, Plato, and and then he, he the, the the main reason he he gets the reason why he is coming to Persia, why he is coming to the East. Uh, he's trying to find the meaning of life, the fountain of life, the fountain of eternal life, and why you need to be to to be immortal. And uh, uh, the idea of the just society comes up. And so the main reason why he's trying to come here um, is to build this beautiful uh, society where everyone is equal, sort of a socialist ideas, but at a, the, at a um, completely different level. And then he elevates even to the um, level of the saint and even the prophet. So it's a, it's a very interesting story of, um, of Alexander in the East. Fantastic. You are a very good storyteller. I can sit here and listen to all your stories. But it's, um, it's also very fascinating how uh, in the olden days when um, the transport obviously wasn't as easy as it is now. Well, I'm not talking about this period. This is not easy now. <laughs> yeah, that's cool. But usually, you know, when uh, they had to move from one place to another with horse and I don't know, camels and caravans and things like that. Stories translated almost um, perfectly from one culture to another. And it's, it's amazing to see, as you said, uh, similar stories keep appearing in different languages, different culture. It's, it's, it's amazing. It should be the power of a story to have something to do with it. Um, it's of course the power of the a particular author, uh, his skill and talent, but of course uh, all the stories, they're, they're more or less dealing with the universal subject. Love, life, death, and, um, and what you can make out of your own life. Because uh, um, I love um, reading with my students a very interesting rubai, which is described to Hayyam. And it is about a fly, Ahmad Magyaso Nopi Dasud. So it's, what, what is the say, point of the- Say that again, please, Firuza. Can you repeat that? Oh, it's, um, the, the rubai starts with, Ye katri obud ve daryo yek dasud. Ye zare yek hot bud ve daryo ve so what's the point of this fly coming to this world and disappearing without any trace? And it, from the first class, it seems to be a bit pointless and depressing, really. But then I'm trying to explain to my students, no, not at all, just the opposite, because this is up to you to make um, your life meaningful and to leave the trace in the world. For example, Hayam, even if he didn't write this particular Rubai, yeah. and uh, uh, people now are ascribing it to him, and his name is known to all people who are interested in, in Persia or Iranian culture. So he left this trace for us, and uh, it, it's been already for so many centuries that we do remember him and, and we all know him. Fantastic. Uh, Firuza John, in which language do you tend to write? Of course, in the beginning, I, I was writing in Russian. But when I got my job in Oxford, of course, I, I, I had to write only in English. And uh, sometimes um, when I would go to Iran and uh, I, I would need to present my paper in Persian. Mm -hmm. um, but um, yes, uh, it's more or less probably mainly English. But I must say that um, for the um, 
only two days ago, I, I wrote um, an article mm -hmm. for a very popular magazine, which is published by the um, Iranian Cultural Center. It is in Russian, and uh, I was writing about the millennium of um, the death of Ferdowsi, which we're commemorating this year. It's a very important date. And I was so surprised <laughs> to, to receive the absolutely instant reaction. And not only from the general public, from my colleagues who would never read <laughs> my scholarly papers at, at such a speed. And I would never receive such an immediate um, uh, reply and response. So it, it means that, and for example, I was asked um, a couple of times to participate in some films, documentary films, for example, especially about the story about um, uh, Hosro Mirza's journey to, to St. Petersburg. And that, that was again, um, a, a very sort of flattering and uh, a nice way to communicate with your public, with, with your audience, because mm, normally academics, they, they wouldn't expect <laughs> whatever effort you, you apply uh, to writing your, creating your new baby, right? Because you, you spend so much time preparing for, mm, for this, um, say reading and then writing and rewriting many times and then finally it is published and um, maybe paper was people would be um, dedicated not only to this global data and celebrating the uh, yet another and probably the very last millennium in 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 the last and the, the next 1000 years but I try to um, have a focus on this topic. Mm -hmm. Is the Photography Biennale, which is organized by a very good, good colleague of mine in Tehran. He's called Farosh Javad. And uh, uh, he, that was a fantastic initiative to um, organize the competition, the, the photography festival among um, Iranian photographers, and it's so dedicated to the idea of the Shanima. And so I, in, in that article, I tried to um, reproduce several um, photographs, mm -hmm. and um, people were absolutely fascinated because um, the, the collection was incredible, and they, they very, very masterfully produced um, pictures. Yeah, thank you very Has much. Any of your books or your articles been published uh, in Persian language? There have been several um, papers, mm -hmm. but uh, uh, probably the most recently that was um, our very first book um, on the Shahnameh, published by Oxford, by the um, Bodleian Library, and it's a very nice series. It was, it's called The Treasures of the Bodleian, The Treasures from the Bodleian. And um, the idea is to um, publish um, very accessible, in a very accessible format, but um, by, one, uh, by someone who knows the subject. So it was com it's normally commissioned by an academic mm -hmm. who is mainly at Oxford. Um, but, um, <clears throat> and it is dedicated to one of the treasures of the Bodleian Library. So, um, it's, it was me and uh, Charles Melville. Um, we published this book about um, the um, manuscript, a copy of the Shanama, which is now kept in the Bodleian Library, and it was commissioned by Ibrahim Sultan. So, um, and we thought that it was a real treasure of the um, um, Bodleian Library. So um, quite recently it was translated by um, a very nice lady from Tehran. Mm -hmm. uh, she was um, studying at the, the Fine Arts Academy in Iran and uh, she translated it. And um, 
I, I must say that um, what they used for the cover, it's um, one of the illustrations from, uh, from the manuscript. It is, um, it is this one. But for some reason, this is Simur um, mm -hmm. killed by Isfandiyar. It's a very interesting story because um, Simur, for example, in the case of Rustam, uh, uh, he's a very positive character. He's always helping mm, Rustam, but in case of Isfandiyar, it's the, the completely opposite character. But here he's turned upside down. You, you, you can see the difference? Okay, yeah. So now it's from Diyar and the, the Simur is upside down. And I was, um, um, I was actually puzzled why they didn't keep the original cover. Uh -huh. That would probably the normal thing. And, uh, and the, the, the full version of this um, um, illustration is this one. We have the hawk who is uh, bound in the mountain of Demavant outside Tehran and we have Feridun riding Tau Barmaya, uh, who, according to, to the story, must have been already dead by this time, but he's still riding the, the cow because she, she helped him to survive with his parents killed by, by the horrible tyrant. Um, but I was explained that this cover would have uh, probably unnecessary connotations with the, can you recognize what they meant? It was probably the crucifixion scene, right? Yeah. So the connotation with Christian, um, very, very popular iconography would probably be unnecessary in this case. So they decided to replace it by um, okay. another uh, iconic uh, image, which would be Murk, of course, for the Iranian culture. Interesting insight. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, the Persian book is available for people if they are interested and want to buy it in Iran? Yes, it is published by Farhangistan Hunar by the Fine Arts Academy in uh, Tehran. Mm -hmm. I hope it's available. I, I, I only received uh, this copy and uh, unfortunately I couldn't go for the book launch, um, which is a great shame. I, I, I really wanted to go. Mm -hmm. um, but um, yeah, and uh, I, I'm very glad that that's um, I know so it's well done on that. Launched. And thank you very much for sharing that. Um, you talked about um, how you normally choose um, a language to, to write in. And when you started, uh, you started writing in Russian and then it somehow changed to English, which is understandable. Uh, what makes you decide which language to use for which work, which publication? If I'm asked um, to write, for example, a contribution to a festschrift mm -hmm. in honor of one of my colleagues in Russia, of course it would be in Russian, but nowadays English is an international language. It's like, um, probably like um, Arabic in the Middle Ages. And if we remember the famous story about uh, Biruni, who was a very famous scholar of the 11th century. And um, he was Khwarezmian by origin. And he was uh, uh, writing ma mainly in Arabic. And that was probably one of the reasons why uh, Khwarezmian doesn't exist anymore. Because even, even the, the carrier of this language would um, willingly move to Arabic so that his works would be accessible to, to the audience. So that would probably be the reason why, why English. <laughs> yeah, yeah, interesting. Um, okay, that's in terms of language. Now, when you want to write something, how do you get your ideas? How do you get inspiration? You do a lot of work on uh, Persian literature, particularly Shahnameh. Do you get the inspiration for the work from Shahnameh or is it elsewhere that you tend to uh, rely for your inspiration and ideas to write? The more you read, the more um, ideas um, this reading generates. And um, 
um, it's just um, probably the bottomless ocean of um, various ideas. Mm -hmm. For example, um, for for many years, scholars couldn't really decide when and how Ferdowsi was working, right? And uh, mm, in the end, uh, now it is a common knowledge that, for example, Ferdowsi started um, his poem with the story, which is nowadays in the middle of um, of his uh, great um, magnum opus. And it is a story of Bishan Manizé, and it is not actually of Persian origin, it's of Parthian origin. And we know only several, several works which have survived from those periods. And one of them is Bisur um, Amin, and, uh, and the other is, uh, is uh, the story of Bishan Manizé. And uh, thanks to Firdosi, we have it preserved mm -hmm. in his beautiful, fantastic poem. So um, oh, the, the more you read, and uh, Ferdowsi was more or less the founder of uh, so many genres, and, and the, he had so many heirs in Persian literature who would take only one story and develop into uh, 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 their beautiful works. For example, like Bahram Gur by Nizami, right? Mm -hmm. the, in the genre, it's a very short story. He, he, it doesn't go into, into any detail. It's actually a very, um, it doesn't give um, a lot of explanations why, for example, Bahram Gur killed this poor girl, Azade, just because she was so annoying and called him a div. But in, in uh, Nizami's story, we have a fully developed novel and, uh, and the motivations of, of the prince. And, uh, and the, the girl is now not Azade, but Fitne. She's rebelling against her fate of being killed so unfairly. And uh, Nizami turns the whole story to a sort, sort of a Persian Cinderella story. She, she is making her own fate and she marries the, the king. So instead of being killed, she she manages to, to do what she wants. Mm -hmm. So um, the, the more you read Persian literature, the, the, the more you have um, ideas what you can do with this. And of course, we have another dimension, visual dimension, because these beautiful um, poems were illustrated during many centuries. And every single artist, he, he would have his own ideas how he would illustrate a particular mm -hmm. episode. So we have multi-layered uh, interpretation of the same story. And the uh, scholars, academics, this is such a fertile um, soil for them so to, to study. And, uh, mm -hmm. and, and these uh, days, I mean, with uh, quite a lot of uh, writing, unfortunately, not a, a lot of people read those unless the, there is a, some sort of a state of celebrity or something with the associated with the writer, which is a whole different story. But in terms of your own writing, what do you hope your reader, or do you like your reader to get out of your writing? I would feel probably our readers are our colleagues. And the, the, the best you, you can expect would be feedback by those who understand what you're writing about. On the other hand, it would be really good to have a wider audience so that uh, you would um, be able to explain what you mean by this um, um, rather narrow field. It would, be, it would be really good to expand it and get the, the opinion of those um, who are genuinely interested in the subject. And not just because they, they know this particular um, field. But um, I think this is what, um, and, and why we need to go to the popular um, um, publications, like films, like um, documentaries. And I'm, I'm so grateful to you, Shahire, because <laughs> you, you, you are doing what uh, should be done by us. 
And for example, if we have an exhibition, they, we need to be, we shouldn't be lazy and we, we should produce as, as many, for example, podcasts or explanations why we're setting up this exhibition, why we're doing this, why it is so important. N not only now, but for, and, and not, and not only now and here, but um, everywhere. And uh, nowadays, using this uh, technological uh, um, um, equipment, right? Like the Zoom, like Instagram, like yeah. um, like all this um, media, it, it would be really a good way to disseminate and uh, um, and uh, try to to tell what we've been doing and what and, it is, and why. It is very important and we are very lucky that during this pandemic we've, as you said, we've got access to At the all moment that technology. I'm engaged in two projects. One is um, a very, very long overdue um, edited volume on, um, on the early Qajar period. And uh, the, 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 the main um, focus is on um, diplomacy um, and how diplomacy is applied in art and literature. Mm -hmm. So it's a very interesting turn. So I've got contributors from different countries, from, from um, Iran, from um, um, Georgia, from uh, United States, from England, from uh, Russia. And um, I, uh, I, I hope that it will be done soon. Then there is another project, uh, which is, um, I think it's this one. It's a pilot version of the catalog of Central Asian art in um, the Fitzwilliam Museum, which is in Cambridge. Um, so the, the, the book launch um, was done in, in a very um, sort of preliminary state stage, but uh, um, I need to finish it. And again, I have several contributors, they're fantastic scholars from Cambridge and from Oxford. And uh, um, um, yes, yeah, so uh, I hope it will be done soon as well. Me too. I hope to see that. <laughs> um, the book that you showed us earlier, the very first book that you've written with, uh, I think, Professor Charles Merwood, and um, if people want to buy it, is that on Amazon? Would Unfortunately, it's uh, out of print at the moment. Oh. And um, um, perhaps we will have to do a second edition. It would be good. But the, the first book I published was on, on the commentary in the Quran, of the manuscript, which is now in Lahore. Uh -huh. And I hope it is still... Um, it still exists because uh, after I finished my PhD, that was uh, based on my PhD, there was a horrible fire in the university. And uh, I, I was writing to them asking if it is still <laughs> there and uh, I never received any answer. So maybe when you will be interviewing um, Zahra Hasanaga, she, she's now in Lahore. Uh -huh. So maybe she would be able to. Say something. Uh, can you that. say the name of the book again? What is it called? It it's called um um tafsir um commentary in the Quran based uh -huh. on the whole manuscript. Okay, right. Thank you very much. And no, it no. was written in the in the end of the tenth century. It's the earliest beginning of the eleventh century. The the earliest um um text in. Uh, in new Persian language, because before it was all in Arabic, and it's a fantastic way to see how even the Arabographic alphabet was, um, um, they, they started to use for, for the needs of the Persian language, because in those days they would even have special signs, how to identify different uh, short, long vowels, and uh, even those um, sounds which do not exist anymore in Persian. Okay, very interesting. Yeah, <laughs> really. I certainly want to find out more about that. Has there been a book, right? reading it, has changed your life or had a profound effect on I your life? I love the book by um, Dostoevsky. Uh -huh. 
Um, some people find him a bit difficult and uh, gloomy and, uh, um, yeah, he, he, he wasn't a very optimistic person. But um, especially later when I started to um, study Persian and Persian culture, mm -hmm. I found that uh, his idiot is, is very similar to what, for example, we can find in Rumi's stories. Okay. About the, the tripartite um, construction of um, the human soul, the spirit, and the, and the body. Right? The, and what we have in the idiot, we have Nastasia Filipovna, the girl, who is um, symbolizing the, the human nature at its best, although she is, a, she is a more or less a, um, not really a prostitute, but she, she is representing the lowest level of uh, human society because she happened to be there. But by nature, she is much more elevated than all others, members of the aristocracy described in the novel. And uh, um, her two mm, lovers or those two men who are in love with her, they represent more or less the same man. That, and um, one is um, uh, what we call Del, and one is what we call John. And if you remember the, the um, um, fragment in Nizami's uh, Farhad and Shirin, right? The, when he say, Nukhustin bar guftash kas kujayi begoft as dare mulki ashnayi begoft unja besan ad darche kushand begoft an do kharando jan furushand begoft a jan furushin adab niist begoft as ash bazan in ajab niist and then begoft as del shudi asher de jinsan and he replies begoft as del tu migui man as John. So, and uh, it's, it's amazing how actually in this idiot, we have all three here, right? And, uh, and it's amazing because Dostoevsky didn't know well Persian classical poetry, literature, but the, this u u universal ideas, they're, they're everywhere. True, yeah, thank you. Um, I think it's this book is translated into Persian with the name Abla. And uh, obviously yes. you have the pleasure of reading it in its um, original language. The, the language of the Stajewski is quite difficult. And he was um, even inventing his own words. And the syntax is quite complicated. It, it, it's not probably a pure pleasure for the lovers of the Russian language to, to read, but it's he it's fascinating the, what, what he was um interesting in 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 his novels yeah thank you thanks for sharing that with us um if you were to describe yourself in three words what would they be well it's difficult um i i, I don't really know because um Probably it's not really up to me to <laughs> to say this. Um, I I find it really difficult to, mm -hmm. to to say who I am. Okay, not to worry. Not <laughs> um, for me, as I mentioned before, um, if I were to describe you in a word, I would say storyteller is definitely one of. <laughs> Because you're very good at um, you know telling all these stories that you've come to to get to know during your research and sharing it with others. So thank you very much for doing that. Um, thank you. It's, it's it's you know we all know who the Shah Khan is, and uh, uh, one of my favorite Shah Khans is uh, Gurda Farid. Uh -huh. she, she lives now in California, but uh, she is a good friend. Uh, of, of ours and uh, she's a fascinating lady. She, she was the first one who started doing this uh, as a lady, especially if, in, in Mashad. Yeah. So yeah. apart from learning by heart, 
the Shahnama, this huge poem, um, to, to be able to do this in public and with this absolutely fantastic skills. I think it's a it's a pure heroic deed. Yeah, she she Best is wonderful. Award, um, advice that you've heard or you've you were given. So if you want to advise some someone, what would be the best thing that you could tell them? The worst advice probably I I had was when I was at Oxford and uh, I was um I was advised not to do um just to to engage myself with my research and teaching and uh, not to try to defend my personality. <laughs> but I, I, the, the main lesson I learned from those days is that uh, good should be able to defend itself. And uh, the, the best advice, I think, is um, when I was writing my PhD, because I was writing it for, for several years and uh, we, had, we had the limit in those days. It, it had to be finished, started and finished in three years. Yeah. And of course yeah. it's, a, it's a very short period. And I was already at my fourth year. Mm, um, I must say that I, I, I had already started teaching because I was asked by the department to, to start um, classes with, with the undergraduates. Mm, and um, there was a delay and uh, one of my professors came and uh, said, listen, uh, you must always remember that, that, that excellent is the worst enemy of good. So you need to stop somewhere and not to be a perfectionist. The, you, you, you can become a perfectionist later, but you, you need to produce a good quality research and uh, submit it and be happy. <laughs> And I, I think that was probably, probably In terms a very of, good advice. Uh, where we are now, and um, how do you deal with the limitation that today's life is putting on all of us? To be completely honest with you, I don't really suffer much from this limitation. Of course, um, I had so many plans, especially travel plans, to go and. Um, attend some conferences and um, um, meetings. But uh, with all this technology in, in hand, it, it, it's not absolutely vital. We, we, we can see each other being in, in, in Manchester and in Cambridge mm -hmm. and we can communicate perfectly well seeing each other, seeing even our emotions and what we're, um, you know, mm. f feeling. And, but of course, it's something completely different. It would be nice to to visit and, and see your relatives. My mother is 93 and she lives in St. Petersburg or my son. I haven't seen him for already half a year. But um, yes, if, um, for example, I've never walked so much in all my life. We're using our daily walking allowances. <laughs> Um, at, at full scale and uh, for example we walk to um, the uh, Grantchester Meadows which is probably the most scenic and most beautiful part of Cambridge okay. um, and we witness the change of all the seasons starting from more or less winter when all the trees were bare and, um, and, and now we, we have full bloom and uh, we, we saw the um, the absolutely beautifully um, yellow um, the fields of rape and, and it, it was absolutely wonderful to, to see all this beauty of nature um, and the, when we were you know running around to, between the faculty and, and the office and then home and the college you, you wouldn't really notice all this beauty it's true, yeah, you tend to notice more. And I think the weather and, out and the, there the, must this be... This is another one from, I, I brought from Tehran. Wow. This is um, uh, another... Um, I, I've just finished the paper on uh, the Persian version of um, 1001 Night. Um, it, it actually, um, Orientalist ballets. 
and the Shehrazad in particular. This is one of my um, subjects I, I particularly like. And uh, this is the manuscript which is kept in the Gulistan Palace. Okay. Um, and uh, it's very peculiar because it was produced um, especially for the Shah. And all his courtiers were uh, depicted as, um, as the characters from uh, the 1001 Night. So it's sort of a um, 19th century Photoshop. When we get back to, well, I wouldn't say as before, because I don't think we ever get back to how we were, but if we get back to a more normal state of mind and state of affairs, do you think we as humans, do we tend to change? And if yes, in what way? How would we change after going through this experience? Um, yes, I think everybody is uh, trying to figure out what is going to happen, right? And uh, what normal life is going to be and uh, what sort of no normality it, it, it will be because it's no, it's never going to be the same. And the people will learn how to, um, not to go, for example, um, far away if, if they don't have to. Or um, everyone is is noticing, especially in, in the megapolises, like for example, London or Beijing or New York, that it's much better nowadays. When, when there are so few cars, but of course people will have to go back to their normal life and um, a part of the normal life for many people is commuting and going back to, to their um, working places. But w what would be the no no normal working place? Because if people are more or less accustomed to working from home, maybe that would be a solution for the normal future life yeah yeah we just wait and hope for the best <laughs> right yes. now not much that we could do thank you very much for uh, giving me this time to have a chat with you it's always a pleasure to talk to you thank you very much for sharing your story thank you very much Zahira, for for um, for this idea to to um, um, interview women who are interested in um, apart from from their families because nowadays there is no really much difference between what the, the role of women and men uh, is in the society so we're both engaged in more or less the same um, contribution we're, we're contributing more or less at the same level